Hey guys, I'm Phil Town from Real One Investing, and today I want to talk to you about how concerned you should be about inflation in our country. So as you already know, unless you're living under a rock, the events of the 2020 pandemic have created havoc. And they're following us into 2021 and have taken a huge toll on human life, on politics, and really a big toll on the economy about what's going on in the economy and how we've responded to it. And we've done amazing things. I mean, we went from an incredibly high unemployment rate uh, to several businesses still unable to work at full capacity, right? I mean, the government has attempted to help people during these hard times with aid like stimulus checks and small business loans that don't have to be repaid. And this kind of spending has a lot of people worried about hyperinflation and what that might mean for the U.S. dollar. Now, hyperinflation is a term we haven't really heard much of since the 70s. But boy, we heard about it then. So you better learn about it. It's a term that most people really don't understand beyond knowing it probably isn't a good thing. You know, they think in terms of Zimbabwe, Argentina, you know, third world countries, crappy governments. (laughs) And yet, hyperinflation has has struck every single economic system, empire, every one of them, finally succumbed to hyperinflation. So these things can cripple a country so swiftly and so completely, they're like an economic pandemic. So let's look at a few factors that are causing so much concern and how this can influence our investing decisions. So first off, factors that are contributing Um, to inflation would be a reduction of the buying power of the U.S. dollar. That's typically what 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 contributes to it. And since people can't buy as much as the dollar devalues, then they want higher wages. And since companies have to pay more as as the prices go up for sugar, right? Coca-Cola has got to increase the price of its Coca-Cola. So um, that ultimately is part of what creates inflation. Another part that really makes it difficult is debt. Um, And that's basically because of the response to debt. Often countries have to respond to debt since they don't have the money to pay it. They print money and that contributes to the devaluation of their currency and ultimately inflation. So um, one of the things that the United States did that's just amazing in 2020, I still can't believe I really have this right. So check this out for yourself. But what I've read repeatedly from really good sources is that we printed to offset the impact of COVID starting right in February. We printed, we sitting down, we printed 35% of all of the money that's ever been printed in U.S. history. We printed last year. Now, what that is, is called the M1 money supply. Okay, so this is the money that's in your bank account, checking account, savings account. This is in under your mattress. It's sitting in banks around the world. Um, This is the stuff you would you think of as spending. Okay, so this is spending money, M1 money supply. We just printed 35 percent of the total M1 money supply ever, which might have some kind of impact, you think? on inflation. And guess what? You might not notice this yet, but last year in 2020, the US dollar went down against a basket of other currencies around the world by 12%. And for the first time in a long time, China did not devalue its currency in lockstep with the US dollar. This is huge rule one investor front page news because what it says is that China might be decoupling. They might be trying to shift their economy from being incredibly dependent on the U.S. consumer over to being dependent on the Chinese consumer. So China is thinking maybe we're growing our middle class big enough that they can consume enough to keep this economy growing just from China. So this is, of course, where the Chinese want to go. They want to be as powerful a nation economically as the United States and then eclipse the power of the United States by their sheer size, the numbers of people they have there, their economic system, which strangely, and oh my gosh, I'm going to get some letters on this one, and you can check me out. I might be wrong, 
But I believe, and I, I don't mean this in a detrimental way, Chinese people, I believe that although they call this system communism, that they have, you know, it's a state controlled system. So it's totalitarian of one sort or another. Um, and they're, they're calling it communism, which is uh, a system where the government controls all of the sources of revenue in the economy. Doesn't really sound like China over the last 35 years. I mean, China from 1946 when Mao Zedong beat Chiang Kai-shek and formed, you know, really pushed the country into, you know, all for one, one for all sort of Marxist communism. 35 years ago, they shifted away from it in a major way. And man alive, I don't think you can call it communism if you've got a country that is running on capitalistic structure. I mean, they got all kinds of private businesses, right? So the question is, how much influence does the state have? If they have total influence, then okay, that's socialism slash communism. If they only influence, in other words, if they own it, if they only influence it, like, hey, go this way, or hey, go that way, or you twitch, you do one more thing like that and we'll slap you down. That's not communism. That's not socialism. That's fascism. And fascism, I don't mean to have fascism got to be literally a dirty word uh, when the Nazis system, you know, which was national socialism, um, you know, did so many horrific things in the world. Calling somebody a fascist is like calling them a racist, bigot, murdering bastard. Right. So I don't mean any of that. I just mean the economic system fascism. And uh, as as a system, what it is, is government control of a capitalistic economy. Um, and man, that starts to look like China. And man, it's effective, obviously, unless you've been, again, living under a rock. You might notice that the Chinese have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps into the second largest economy in the world. And I mean, they've done it quick in 35 years. This is really astonishing. And this is the promise fascism held for people back in the 1920s when it started to become popular in Germany and, and Italy and Spain. And I'm really the promise was the most perfect form of economy because you don't have theoretically the massive ups and downs of people losing their butts in their capitalistic efforts in a laissez faire capitalistic system where there's these massive shifts of wealth and ups and downs and a lot of volatility and fascism. The idea was an intelligent government would soften that and soften the blow by picking winners like stepping in on General Motors and not just having it go bankrupt and everybody, you know, all the bondholders get paid according to the contracts that they have with GM. They were required to be paid off. And, you know, a government could step in and soften that and say, oh, I'm sorry, bondholders, we're going to give you shares of stock. You're not going to get paid off according to your contract. And I'm sorry about that. But we're going to support this company and make sure nobody gets fired. And we don't want to lose all these subsidiary companies. We don't we don't want the labor unions to go. You know, everybody's unemployed. We're going to step in and help you. And they basically nationalized GM for a little while. And it's a soft peddled version of fascism in the U.S. And again, I don't mean that as a derogatory word. I mean it as a legitimate economic system that we've kind of I mean, the old laissez faire USA pre Federal Reserve Bank 1913, you know, pre 1913. Nah, you would never see that. And we would have this massive depression in the Detroit area, right? And, and and everybody's unemployed and would be an absolute mess for years there and all the suffering that goes on. Hey, we have stepped in from the federal government and softened the blow. We softened the blow with AIG dramatically. We softened the blow with all these banks that had all these derivative investments that they didn't have a clue that they had. They didn't know that they were sitting on a nuclear financial bomb that went off or was going to go off and they would wipe them out. And in a matter of just a week, the federal government stepped in, took over AIG, took over the obligations, forced, get this, forced several of our national, of our biggest banks to take money from the federal government who banks that didn't need it, banks that didn't do that kind of crazy derivative trading. And they forced them to do it to take the money, kind of force them to buy these crappy assets um, in the name of not unfair, unfairly 
penalizing these other national national type banks, these other great big banks. I mean, I don't know what you call that. It's not certainly not capitalism. So let's call it what it is and just start to understand that as we have a bigger and bigger government that does more and more things and interferes more and more, interferes or helps more and more with companies, we can end up with these kinds of situations. And the U.S. dollar devaluation is part of that, you guys. Um, I got to tell you that in a, in a strictly capitalist system, when the dollar was backed by gold, we had the dollar in 1800 would buy a certain amount of goods. Let's say it'd buy a sack of rice. By 1935, the dollar would still buy a sack of rice. And we were on the gold standard and, you know, we had some ups and downs, but we basically, in 135 years, the dollar still had all of the value that it had in 1800. This shocks people. They don't realize that because we've had, you know, generations of people now have grown up with the idea that there's constant inflation and the Federal Reserve tries to have 2% inflation. They found that it's just better. People are happier when they see their wages going up, even if it's fake. Okay, it's fake because you, you don't get to buy anymore with your, you know. So 1935, FDR, you know, nationalizes gold. It takes everybody's gold and then sells dollars to Europe in exchange for gold. He bought all the gold in the United States for $20 an ounce and then sold gold to roughly, you know, $35, $40 an ounce to Europeans and effectively devalued the dollar by 50% overnight. And that was the first major step down for the dollar. And since then, Every administration has to some degree continued to devalue the currency. Now, the Eisenhower administration didn't do it very much. Uh, but when Lyndon Johnson got into power, he got welfare. He opened up welfare. He did Medicare, civil rights, which didn't have much effect on the economy. I'm just saying it's the whole act of everything. Let's try to fix a bunch of stuff here. And by 1991, we have to go, we, we planted so much money to pay for Vietnam and all that stuff. We had to go off the gold standard. Nixon took us off the gold standard, defaulted on all of our obligations to all of our European partners to pay them back their gold at $40 an ounce. You said we well, were not going to do it. And the reason is because we don't have the gold. You got more money than we got gold because we kept printing money and we have we haven't even slowed down. Then we shifted to petrodollars. We absolutely increased the printing press over the last 30 years, 40 years. And man, I'll tell you, over the last 10 years, it's been just accelerating and accelerating. Debt went up roughly from $7 trillion under Obama to $20 trillion under Trump. We've printed 35% of the cash. I mean, it is a rocket ship to economic catastrophe. And the only, only real reason that it won't happen next year is that all of our trading partners have been devaluing their currency in lockstep with the United States for two reasons, because they've done the same thing we've done. And second, because they want to sell us Mercedes Benzes and Hyundais and Toyotas. And if they don't devalue their currency at the rate we're devaluing our currency and the, and the world is paying for things with the, with the dollar as a reserve currency, you will not be able to sell your cars to the United States. A, a Mercedes will cost a million dollars. So they got to do it. And that has been feeding this machine in such an incredible way that there's now an economic theory that we can print as much money as we want. And I promise you, the Democrats are going to be influenced by that. Uh, Trump, Trump, Trump obviously was not holding back in the least. Um, and now that the Republic, Republicans are out of power, I guarantee you they're going to be born again, you know, deficit uh, hawks. And they're going to want us to, you know, balance the budget. And you're going to hear a bunch of screaming about that on Fox. So just prepare yourself for that because it's the Republicans being, you know, the ridiculous the way every political party is ridiculous. And so the Democrats are already promising two trillion. And I guarantee you, if this economy starts to falter, you'll see interest rates go down to negative interest rates and they'll just print whatever money they got to print and they won't be giving it to the banks. They'll be sending it to people who are making less than 30 or 40 thousand dollars a year. And that will stimulate the heck out of the economy. It will stimulate the stock market like you, like it's on, you know, jet fuel. And this is what happens in companies or countries that are going into hyperinflation. Several kinds of assets take off like a rocket. Real estate's one of them and the stock market's one of them. So we sit here looking at a stock market that's already at a two and a half percent yield, which is insane, insanely high. It's at a 200 percent Wiltshire GDP, which is over double as high as historically the averages are. And yet it could go much, much higher 
if we start heading toward uh, the Zimbabwe solution, the Germany solution in, in uh, 1920, uh, just cause their stock market to go like a rocket. And then it's a question of riding it until it bucks you. And you don't want to be there when it bucks you. So we'll dis- we'll discuss this more. But essentially, here's some basic rules. Since 1935 till now, the dollar has lost 96% of its value. And I'm not counting what happened in 2020. I could guess real easily we're down 97%, 98% of buying power from what it was in 1935. And that's astonishing. And it is really horrific because of all of our trading partners having to stay in lockstep with the US dollar. We're screwing everybody everywhere. So it'd be great if we didn't, but we can't stop because my God, we'd go into a depression tomorrow. So I hate I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you might as well get economic reality in front of you. The best thing we can do, I think, is just try to soften it as much as possible. And that would be probably what they're doing, print more money and try to work our way out of it. I don't know exactly how they're going to do that. Meanwhile, have assets. Don't be sitting on cash for the next 10 years. Although it looks like the least risky kind of investment, it's the worst by far. That doesn't mean you should spend your cash right now. Warren Buffett's sitting on 150 to 160 billion short term. Deal with it. You know, we're looking for this market to correct and find things we can buy. All I can tell you is the only safe place to put money right now is in wonderful companies that are on sale and there's just just very difficult to find them. I would encourage you guys, get out there, learn how to do this stuff to protect your family, be the hero for your family and get yourself prepared for an economic downturn. It could come, all right? So how are you preparing? I'd love to hear from you guys. You know, leave a comment below and I'll follow up with you. Thanks for watching. And uh, sorry about all that bad news. There's There's gotta be a silver lining, right? So now go play, see ya. If you enjoyed this video and you feel it was valuable in teaching you more about how inflation could impact the US dollar, hit the like button and please share the video with your friends, you guys. And if you want more investing content, subscribe to my channel. Oh yeah, and guess what? We got a wonderful free gift for you right there. Just don't forget to click the button and thanks again for watching.